Social media is such a wonderful thing. I put a tweet out. What is it called these days? I put an X out. <laughs> uh, and saying that I would like to meet some Aston Villa fans. The reason of which uh, I'll give you in a minute. And all of a sudden, but it was just a hope to be a conversation about Aston Villa, the club, what's happening right now. He has become this. <laughs> a selection of um, really clever content creators or people that have got a good story to tell about Aston Villa. We're meeting, thanks to Green King, who said straight away, we'll just host you, we'll host you, we'll put the three cameras that you may not see, but they're down there, there's a sound man, it's a producer, director, everything. So we're coming out with this podcast, video, whatever you're watching it, in which we're hoping to get to know Aston Villa a little bit more. I will because I just don't know enough about Aston Villa. And the first thing I want to do is I want you to all introduce yourselves, starting with, with myself, I'm Guillermo Balaguer. I am a storyteller and I do tell my stories through podcast or social media, uh, television, radio and books. And I have started writing a book about Aston Villa. It's not a history book, uh, I'm not looking back. I'm actually taking a picture of Aston Villa right now and want to see what's happening, how a club that is a huge club has managed to turn into a very, very competitive side as in the Champions League. How did that happen? And who helped with that? The new ownership, Unai Emery, I'll touch on all that. But I had to start somewhere. And this is basically the start of my book, an opportunity to uh, sit down in the mold house, uh, the sports pub that Green King has got in the center of Birmingham. And these are my new friends, starting with... So uh, my name's Joe Boone. I'm a freelance sports journalist uh, and I've been a Villa fan for 21 years. Uh, my first game is it was 2007-8. Uh, we beat Newcastle in classic Villa fashion, 1-0 down at halftime. Uh, I think Michael Owen scored for, for Newcastle that day. And then after halftime, Wilfred Boomer and then a, a John Carew hat trick. So. Classic Villa fashion, a roller coaster performance, but we were we were successful in the end. Oh, I'm going to have to learn about what the Villa classic game is. <laughs> yeah, you but will, is yeah, that yeah. kind of thing, is it? Yeah, very very entertaining football club to support is a, a kind way of putting it. I think so. <laughs> so yeah, that's my first game. My name's Baz, lifetime Villa fan, day jobs lawyer. That's not as interesting as uh, f following Villa. Also host a podcast with my mate Will, talk of the Trinity. My first game was before football began, so before the Premier League. It was March 1992, half-empty stadium. I think those I've just looked it up today. 19 and a half thousand played QPR. Probably similar to a lot of people's stories here today. We lost <laughs> one nil. Most memorable thing about the game was I had some cheese and onion crisps. <laughs> uh, really enjoyable, but kind of didn't have a choice. Sport and Villa from Birmingham, born and bred. Mom sported Villa, her dad, his dad, his dad, pretty much follow it all, all the way back. So I was stuck with that, really. You say some other stories have to do with losing. Uh, th th this is another part of the essence I have to learn about Aston Villa, that uh, you have to yeah. deal with losing a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's called life lessons, I think. And you know, you set the bar kind of at that level. So you enjoy the good times even more when they come like they are now. Okay, masochists, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm Simon O'Regan. I do the Holtcast podcast. Um, I've had a season ticket at Villa, I think since 97, 98. It was the first year I got the season ticket. My first game was the last time we actually won a trophy. It was the 1996 League Cup final. We beat Leeds 3-0 in what I still think is arguably the most one-sided cup final, certainly in that League Cup competition I've ever seen. We battered them that day. And I kind of thought, do you know what? I've, I've picked the right club for me. And little did I know that um, that was going to be the highest of highs there that we've had so far. But I think there's going to be better times to come. But it's um, it's been a roller coaster supporting Aston Villa, definitely. How confusing it must be, right? When the first game you go to, you win a title and you think, that, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, and I think my second game, we beat Liverpool 1-0. And before going to that, my nan said, you know, you're not going to win every game. And I came back <laughs> saying, you're great. No, honestly, we're the best team in the world. And <laughs> she knew better than I did. But um, yeah, no, it's, it, it was confusing. It certainly set me up for expecting more trophies. But I, I think more to come, definitely. That took you 
to those games. Or? Yeah, yeah, dad, yeah. And so I've got um, three brothers, two older, one younger, all Villa fans. The whole family is all Villa man, except for one black sheep of the family, my uncle, who's a, a Birmingham City fan, but we don't talk about him. <laughs> So my name's Ben Moore. Um, I've been supporting Villa now for nearly 20 years. Um, I've got my own uh, Twitter blog. That's what I do. Um, recently ventured into the TikTok world, trying to trying to clock that. How's um, that going? It's it's all right. It's very hard to get into, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, yeah. So my first experience of the club was a uh, two 0 loss to Manchester United. I think I've been traumatised by Manchester United ever since that. So, um, but yeah, I think better times to come for the club. So we're, we're definitely on on the on the way up, and it's a pleasure to see where we are at the moment. So we really heard defeats uh, shouldn't be confident with one victory and trauma. That is also essence of being the nest of Villa fan, is it? Definitely so, especially when Manchester United are involved. <laughs> just, we haven't had many um, positives from that fixture. Okay, well, what is it with Manchester United? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a curse, if I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> Let's add the cares to the list. Um, I'm Gemma. I think I'm probably the only one of you guys who aren't a content creator. Um, I'm involved with the Villa and Proud group. Um, I've been supporting Villa since probably since I was like born, to be fair. Um, the first game I remember that I didn't fall asleep at was uh, versus Wimbledon in about 94, 95. So you were like four? Yeah, so I was really little. So like I say, I was falling asleep. Um, so we won 7-1. I think Tommy Johnson scored a hat-trick, mm. um, which I thought was obviously brilliant. Um, and yeah, kind of go home and away every week and just absolutely love the club. So when you are so little and it is a big win, the noises must be enormous for such a little person. Yeah. What do you remember it? You weren't scared about it. You were actually attracted to it. Uh, no, I don't think I was scared of it. I think because, like I say, I think I'd probably been to games before, but obviously fallen asleep at those right. kind of in the second half. Um, but yeah, kind of, I think I would probably got used to it by then. Like, I think, what was I, six, seven, so. Yeah, really small and yeah, go with my dad every week. And, and the peak of your time as an Aston Villa fan, if it comes, oh. does it come to mind straight away? Um, at the moment, it's probably that, that playoff final. I think that's kind of the the biggest kind of success we've had that I can truly remember, apart from obviously a couple of Coca-Cola Cups, which my dad wouldn't let me go to the final because I was too small. Mm. Um, so that's the um, to go to the into the Premier League playoffs too. Yeah, to go final. into the play into the playoffs. That's seven minutes. I think I don't ever want to think about it ever again in my life. But yeah, absolutely love the club. Got a tattoo and uh, yeah, everything. Where? What's the tattoo? It's um, it's on my ribs and it's okay. um, like a claret and blue lion. Good, good. Um, my name's TJ. A uh, bit of an outlier of an accent, um, <laughs> but I've been a Villa fan. I'd say for about 15 years now, um, when uh, my family first moved to England, my dad actually worked at Villa Park um, as a cleaner. Um, so he took me to a few games, but the first proper game I remember was Second City, second city Derby 4-2. Um, um, and yeah, uh, FootNow is, uh, is the content creator uh, page as well. What do you do in there? Um, so for now, we're kind of like a football media company. So we try and be creative with football media. Um, a lot of it does lean to Aston Villa um, for obvious reasons. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, we try and, do something a bit different with football media and make it a bit more creative and uh, aesthetic. So you've got a bit of um, a broad uh, look at the media and the media related to clubs. 100%. I find with, with the first things I've been looking into, listen to some of the podcasts and reading some, some of the blogs, there's a lot of um, talented people trying to tell the story of Aston Villa from different points of view. Would you agree? 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's like everyone here is like, they've got their own different spin on Aston Villa, um, different angles as well. Um, but yeah, I think... It's a great club, so who wouldn't want to talk about it? So why why, why do you feel, I mean, if you're creative, you're creative. And if you're Aston Villa, by the sounds of it, you, you're almost born Aston Villa. Yeah. But why do you think the club um, allows you uh, or gives you the opportunity to tell so many stories? I think because it's, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of law to Aston Villa. Um, I think there's a lot of, you find one story and then that story leads on to another story and then that story leads on to another story. Not titles. Not to, <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I'm saying that because it's easy, it's easy. I've written books about titles. I've written mm. book about Liverpool winning the Champions League final against Milan in Istanbul. Mm. That's an obvious story to tell. Um, <laughs> but when you don't win so much, why is the club so, uh, so, uh, what would be the word? so rich that you can tell so many stories i think there's 
I think with Aston Villa, it's like a big wait. I think all the fans are waiting for that trophy. And I think it's like the anticipation, the way that everyone speaks, like we're all kind of on the same road going towards somewhere. I've never seen Aston Villa win a trophy and I decided to support this club. Um, and I think with a lot of fans, because we're on the same road somewhere and we're all waiting for that trophy, I think we all kind of use these stories to kind of give us a bit more clout, if you will in an effort to get there. I should call the book um, A Giant Awakening or The Awakening <laughs> of a Giant. It's basically that, isn't it? That's yeah. what we're saying. That's okay, what said I'll think about it. Hello, I'm Adam. I have been supporting Aston Villa for over 30 years now. And as you'll tell from my accent, I am not native to Birmingham. So I grew up around Manchester City and Manchester United fans. And my dad was actually a Manchester United fan as well and did his tried his best to make me a United fan. And you know, for years, I probably regretted that decision, probably until this year, where I kind of thought, actually, I've made the right, <laughs> I've made the right choice here. We're finally a bit better than them. Uh, my first game was actually against Manchester United at Villa Park, and I was travelling down the M6 and got stuck in the services. We were about three hours before kickoff, and then ended up being stuck at the M6 and getting there at half time. Missed the only goal, which was a David Beckham goal, and I think about the 11th minute, and saw the most boring second half of football I think ever. Yeah, I think that first time at the stadium always gives you something, doesn't it? That it's the smell, it's the atmosphere, it's wow, look how big it is, but also how small the pitch is. You always expect it to be miles bigger because of what you've seen on TV. Um, but not only a Villa fan, I am also lucky enough to work in the industry as well. So I work with a lot of sports clubs and a lot of sports brands, creating a lot of content. So I'm a chief creative officer for a large marketing agency in Manchester. And over the last six months, I've been taking that experience to TikTok. So something that my teenage kids are a bit embarrassed about and probably take the mick out of me about quite a lot. But I thought, you know what? Who cares? You know, let's let's put it out there and let, let's see what happens. And over the last few months, I've been speaking about my experiences in the industry, both commercially and sponsorship, rather than on the pitch, more so off the pitch. Don't be humble, Adam. You're the one who put all this together as well. <laughs> so thank you for your message, and uh, and it's been a great no, thank uh, you. Great opportunity us. to um, to find common ground with a lot of things that we're doing together, uh, including Big Ultra United. He has to be mentioned at some point. He's <laughs> the club and the chairman. Of, we had a sweepstake. Uh, I that I take actually. Who had nine minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but also um, yeah, it's an opportunity as a, as I'm already finding to uh, to get to know more about Aston Villa, which is exactly what I want what I want to do. Yeah. So brilliant. Look next. Cool, I'm Luke, I'm the creator of Up The Villa Fan Channel. My first memory would have been the semi-final of the FA Cup against Bolton. And I just remember being a kid and seeing the euphoria around that game, flags on cars, flags in the windows of our houses, and it just sort of like encapsulated what it meant to get to a semi-final. And I remember that game, it was, it was nil nil, it went to penalties. And I just remember me and my brother just cheering that it had gone to penalties. And there was just about 30 Villa fans turned around looking at us like, what, what are you on about penalties? Like, we're all nervous and you two kids are cheering. But that's just a memory that I've got of, of how fun that day was really. So um, that's my earliest memory of sporting Villa. I must say though, uh, having been to um, Villa Park recently a few times, I bet it wasn't the same experience that you had at that time, because it's full of roadworks at the moment, isn't it? It's, it's so difficult to get to. Uh, and once you're there, you feel that the, the stadium has to improve, mm -hmm. that, that obviously there is the in intention of it, but um, that the match experience can be better. You, you agree on that? Yeah, I think it can be better. I mean, if we go off the first game, the toilet situation was just <laughs> terrible. Um, but I think, you know, the club's trying to, to grow. It's trying to expand. It's trying to catch up with the, the so-called big six. And, and we've got a lot of ground to make up. But I think on the pitch, we're really good. Off the pitch, we're just trying to find our way. I think it, it still feels like, but hopefully we can get there. I think that you just hit uh, on something that, that, that I sense, which is that this is a club that is going somewhere quite clearly, but it's going very fast. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you kind of fast forward chapter three, four, five uh, to go into the Champions League, perhaps even a little bit earlier than, than expected for sure. Obviously, nobody will complain, but it does feel that the club is now to keep um, doing well in the competitions they're in. They're going to have to do a lot of things that perhaps are not popular. 
thinking ticket prices, maybe we'll touch on that. Uh, but try to find money to keep it at that pace. Do you think that's what's yeah, happening? Yeah, I think if you look at off the pitch, Aston Villa's revenue is, is minute compared to the teams that we're trying to compete with. You know, we're, we are now trying to compete with Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea to maintain our position. And unfortunately, because we've not been there for so long, like you say, we, we've got to really get there quicker than, than we probably, the, the fans can expect us to get there. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just about merging it together and trying to stay where we are. And I think hopefully it's going to come together. I mean, Chris Tech said he wants to increase revenue by 400 million in the next three years. So, you know, those numbers are, are quite high. And I think deals with Adidas and our kit sponsors, that, that they're going to help. And yeah, we've just got to improve our revenue. Chris Hag is the head of business operations at the at the yep. club, um, who who's putting in numbers the ambition of of the club uh, where where you want to head to. Thank you, Luke. Uh, my name's Sam. Um, I'm a musician um, under True Adventures, and um, recently I wrote uh, an anthem for Villa. And um, I, to be honest, I did it just for my own amusement, really because I hadn't really been doing a lot of music. I've been looking after my kids a lot. And um, well, that was pretty much what I was doing. Um, but the success under Unai Emery, it made me feel as if, as everyone's been saying, that we're going somewhere fast and that we need to get something off the pitch and in the stands that matches what's going on on the pitch. So I tried to boil down what it is to be a Villa fan and I think I probably wrote about 10 verses, to be honest, but I tried to boil it down to two because number one, I wanted it to be sung on the stands and um, also it needed to be remembered by people who were three pints deep <laughs> and, um, and aren't natural singers. But I've been a Villa fan since 1993, 94. And um, yeah, I remember my first game and it was probably like a lot of people's, a pretty miserable experience. My dad broke his rib that day it was raining, it was cold, it was nil-nil, nothing happened. And we went home and the car broke down on the way home. And my dad got home and he had a big row on my mum on the way home, uh, when we got home. And I think he probably had one of the worst days of his life. But I thought it was amazing. <laughs> and I think that is the, that's what happens when you're a kid, you know, you just fall in love with this football club. And like other people have said, we just won the League Cup and I thought, well, this is it now. You know, I'm in for a life of glory. <laughs> and um, anyway, it's finally coming to fruition, I think, finally. Do you know people say that uh, you fall in love in a quarter of a second and once you're in love, you're in love, that's it. And I always related that to people uh, by the sense of it, with ex some experiences of some of you on your first day, I think that happens with football clubs as well. Yeah. Quarter of a second, you're in love, that's it. That's it, you cannot get away from it. But um, you saying you are preparing new songs. Uh, do you need any? Do you need a chorus? Can we help you at all? Yeah, with yeah. It? Well, I, I'm going to wait until at least three or four drinks have been done. Okay. <laughs> but what I want to do is I actually want to re-record the song with Villa fans singing it instead, because it's nice that I get to sing it, and that's all well and good. But I don't want it to be my song. I want it to be Villa's song. Liverpool have got "You'll Never Walk Alone" and. Forest have got Mull of Kintyre and a lot of clubs have got songs and I, what have we had? Don't Look Back in Anger and we've tried a few but they're never about Villa and they're never about what it is to be Villa so that was the idea of the song is so that we have something that's ours that's about way the way we feel about Villa you know something that's belongs to us. Well in, in the Mull House we have been looked after, I have to say. So we are on our second drink. If two more come while we're talking, at the end, you're going to have to remind us that you need us because we probably forget. We we'll probably it. forget. We'll it. Thank you, Sam. Um, now, I want to look back a little bit, not too far, but uh, on your own experience. Um, being an Aston Villa fan is exciting now, but yes, we've heard that it hasn't been that exciting for a long time, the period in which you have been fans. So I want to hear from you. Um, Ben, for instance, uh, what it is, what has been to be a fan in the last few years when things are not happening? Yeah, I think it's um, a good good starting point if we, we touch bases on 
when when we was under O'Neill and we were performing relatively well. We was and we we got very very close to to hitting the, the Champions League spots at that point. And from there, Lerner didn't want to put the money in, and he went gradually down and down and down and down, changing manager X Y Z, and it eventually got to the Remy Guard years, which for me were. The, probably the worst years of my life as not just a Villa fan it was just genuinely my worst years of my life it was horrendous um, we were going down to Villa Park and just go but by half time you know he was in a position where you, the game is not even re re recoverable um, so it was just it was miserable <laughs> that's as, 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 bit, as basic as I can put it really and yet and yeah we turned it round you know we, we, we obviously got relegated um, went down to the championship and we thought we had a bit of a, a silver lining when uh Dr. Tony turned up. <laughs> uh, he turned up and uh, nearly drove the club into the ground again. So we, you know, that was a real, real dark time. The club was, you know, we was moments away from going going into like administration, weren't we? And then, uh, which we'll touch bases on a bit, little bit later on. But then N NSWE come and sa sa saved our bacon and so completely turned the club around. So I can't be ha I can't be more happy and privileged to be following the club in the position that we're in now, considering the where, where we were. It's mm -hmm. been a it's been a roller coaster. <laughs> Sounds like it, DJ. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm quite a recent Villa fan, I'd say. Um, I only started putting my effort into Aston Villa maybe like 2013, 2014, and kind of like everyone else said, I was like, oh, this is a this is a great club. We're going to win a lot, and then two years, three years later, we get relegated. Um, and my kind of growing up experience for Aston Villa was in the Championship. That's when I really started to kind of get a grasp of what Aston Villa was weren't selling out the stadiums there was a few empty seats but there was still like you know even when we we're finishing like ninth or tenth in the championship there was still a feeling of this is not where we belong to be this is not where we deserve to be um and i think that season where obviously we got promoted after nswe came in i think that's when i started to kind of get a real feeling of what aston villa meant because i think you only really realize how much people care about something at its worst and then when it gets to the best everyone kind of begins to get on and get on and i think a lot of people don't tend to forget is we almost got relegated that first season and a question i ask myself a lot of the time is what would have happened if we did get relegated do nswe do they leave do we get someone like tony jar back are we perennially uh, a championship club like the other club in our city um well, but you cannot say it. Is it, is it, does it. Does it burn your lips when you say it? I don't want to say I don't want to <laughs> say it. No. I'll just say the other club in our city. Um, so I think that's when I kind of got a gauge for Aston Villa, what it was, what it meant. Um, and, you know, I think ever since the 20, what, 2018, 2019 season, it's just been, it's been up from there. Um, and it's been enjoyable. Um, it's been a lot of ups, a lot of downs, you know, from Dean Smith to Steven Gerrard, now Unai Emery. Um, but I think through it all, I think it's true to say that you, you can fall in love with something three times. The first time, the second time where you're like, oh, I really love this. And then the third time you're like, I'm going to love this for life. Um, and yeah, as someone who that optionally chose to support Aston Villa, not from Birmingham, um, I don't regret it. Don't regret it. Yeah, it's been, for you anyway, it's been a trajectory up from, where, from where you were. So. Yeah. Simon. It's, it's interesting that it was around the 2013-14 you decided Villa was the team for you because <laughs> that was when we were really starting to spiral. I mean, even going back to sort of before the Martin O'Neill period that you touched on, I mean, as I said earlier, I've started going in the mid-90s. And I think, it's, so there's a lot of recency sort of bias and thoughts in football. People don't tend to remember that Villa were like one of the best teams in the 90s in the Premier League. You know, we first year of the Premier League, we finished second on two League Cups. We regularly finished sort of top four, top five, top six. Um, I remember John Gregory around the 99, 2000 or 98, 99 season. You know, we were top of the league in, by the end of January and I mean, we completely collapsed then. <laughs> but we were up, up there and then obviously had the Milo Neal period of great success. So to for me, sort of growing up, we'd always been like a really good sort of regular top five, top six club. And then as uh, uh, Ben mentioned, you know, when Randy Lerner, sort of the money sort of dried out, the way we dropped, it, it, was, it was awful. I mean, the cliche coming in that year, was was the start of of the real rot then and paul lambert had an, an initial sort of you kind of thought there was some something to build on but that very quickly went downhill and then yeah coming in the remy guards yeah the, the year we went down i mean i think by by the october of that season i'd accepted 
we're, we're down here. There's only so many years you can circle the drain before you drop. I remember going to Everton away that season. I think we were three 0 down at half time, and if we had the ball for more than two minutes altogether in that half, I'd be amazed. It, it was honestly one of the worst performances I've ever seen from a club, and. I think the when we went down and even then our first year in the championship we started under Di Matteo and that started off awfully and I, I think that was a serious danger we could have got you know had a, a successive relegations and Steve Bruce you know he's he's has some critics amongst Villa fans but I actually think we actually do owe him a bit of a debt of gratitude so I think he did stabilise the club and obviously it didn't turn out well in the end for him but during those championship years you sort of I'm looking around seeing parts of the ground being closed um, you know, people who worked at the club losing their jobs and we got relegated. I'm thinking how this is not the football club that I fell in love with. This is not a former European Cup winning football team. You know, Aston Villa are a massive, massive football club. And you sort of looking at where we were then and, and how depressing it was at times. And sometimes I did every season I used to say to myself, oh, I'm not I'm not doing this next year. I can't do it next year. But as you sort of touch on, you fall in love with your football club. You, you kind of can't help it. And now it, it just feels like we're in a position I've never seen us be as good sort of on, on the pitch as we are with the manager that we've got. And I'm, I'm starting to feel now that I'm, I'm finally being rewarded for that decade of misery. <laughs> all that pain. Yeah. But actually, do tell me, Simon, what, what it means on that week that you lost, in the middle of that depressive time, what it means personally to be an Aston Villa fan. <sighs> It's hard. <laughs> I mean, like, it, some means I think some people think, oh, come on, it's, it's only football. But but it's not that. And, like, it, as much as you, you do try and tell yourself, OK, it doesn't really matter. But, but it does affect you. And I think, you know, you have to you have to sort of really try hard to make sure that it doesn't have as negative an impact as, as it can do. I, you know, I remember when I was at, at that time in sort of those championship years and uh, those last few years in the Premier League, I was still living at home. And I look back now and I feel so sorry for my mum and dad. So I come home on a, on a Saturday, completely miserable. And like, and, I mean, there's a reason why they were out every weekend <laughs> because they didn't want to have to deal with me coming in. And then you've got your mates, you know, like I've quite a few of my mates have been the fans, but some of the lads that I grew up at the school with, they were Man United fans. I mean, I can laugh at them now, but back in those years, I couldn't. And it's, yeah, it, it can be difficult and, and it does get you down, but you know, you, you keep going, you, you sort of, you develop a sort of gallows humour type thing at the end, because you think if you don't laugh, you'll end up crying, <laughs> so. That gives me also a, a picture of something that is not just Aston Villa, it's football in England. Um, football is a lifestyle here. Uh, in Spain for us, it's a 90 minute game, we can discuss about it during the week, but it's just a, it's just a game. For here, it's a lifestyle, you're talking about weekends, oh, definitely yeah. influences your mood, uh, you create relationships through it, um, it's a wonderful thing, and as a chairman of a football club in England, I know exactly what, what you're talking about. Um, a defeat by Beagles or United, men's or women's sides, it just affects me until the next day. It's, just, it's what happens. Yeah. So, um, you said some of you that uh, are not Birmingham born, but obviously have to come often to, uh, to be at the, at, at close to the club. I would love to know more what uh, the club does for the city and what the city does for the club, and if actually what the city represents He's been represented, well represented by the club and vice versa. What's the link, Sam? I always think if you if you live in Birmingham or wider Birmingham or greater Birmingham, I always think being a Villa fan is like having siblings. Because some clubs, if you're in Newcastle or Norwich or a lot of cities, they're a one club city. And when people go to work, all they talk to is other fans of the same club. And they lose touch with reality. They think that they should be at the top of the tree. And when you go to work in Birmingham, you're with Baggies fans, Wolves fans, Blues fans. And what you learn is that you're in a hierarchy. So when, when I was a kid, there used to be a newspaper called the Sports Argos, and it was pink and it would come out. It's mad to think really, they would publish a paper at about half five after the results finished at like 10 to five and had all the results printed in it. And it wasn't, about Villa and Birmingham, it was about the big six, really, the big six of the West Midlands. And I think that's what it's like. In, in Birmingham, you're fighting for your right to be the top dog. And it's not just Blues, it's Baggies and Wolves. They're everywhere, everyone's vying for it. Luckily for us, we are the top dog and pretty much always have been. 
aside from a few blips. But, but that's what I think it's like. I think it's like having siblings. Every day you go to work and you're arguing with your siblings about who's going to get the big piece of the cheese. It, what's the biggest rivalry then? With Birmingham I mean, it's, Bur it's, it's Villa Birmingham. Yeah. It's Villa Birmingham, but they're everywhere. <laughs> the sharks are everywhere, <laughs> you know. And um, and because we're the big because we're the big club, and we're the club with the history, we started the league, we dominated in you know when football was real football before World War Two. <laughs> you were you born. Know. What are you talking about? <laughs> so it all went downhill from there. <laughs> but because we've got the history, it always feels like everyone's gunning for Villa, and they're always trying to bring Villa down, and. Uh, even when we're down, though, we're still above the other lot. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> Gemma, you've got, a, you've got a story that links uh, inhabitants of the city and the club in yeah. a big way. Um, so we were chatting earlier and I said about like when you go to work, it's you're, the first question you ask is you're either Villa or Blues. Um, but I actually got married at Villa Park um, the year we got relegated, so 2016, which for the club off the pit well on the pitch was was not a great time and especially as a as a big fan that I am um yeah not a great time for us but for me like I say off the pitch that that day was probably like one of the best days of my life was your choice was that your choice um I think it was kind of a bit of a mutual choice um a lot of people were kind of like my friends would go when they go oh you got married at Villa Park that's that's obviously your choice um I would obviously I would have loved that from the start, but I think that would have been too obvious for me to like have put that out there. So when we were kind of looking for venues and things like that, um, Villa Park came up and the the price was right basically. And <laughs> obviously we weren't very good off the pitch, so kind of probably got me a bit of a discount to be fair. Um, but yeah, kind of like I say, club were absolutely fantastic for us. Kind of gave us free reign of where we wanted to go so we had photos in the dressing room in the pit by the pitch dug out they made us a shirt with our, our kind of date and our new double barrel name on it and some of the staff were unfortunately losing their jobs obviously due to relegation um so it was one of their kind of last events that they did so they oh. just absolutely went all out for us and yeah we're still still married happily married so <laughs> expecting our first child so oh congratulations <laughs> thank you <laughs> where, where is the where is the shirt? Um, it's actually just in kind of one of my wardrobe. I've got a shirt wardrobe at home because I collect shirts as well, um, and it's in there. I should probably add it to some of the framed ones that I've got up. Maybe I'll put it in the in the baby's room when he's when he's here. <laughs> Good idea. Now, um, Ben, I'm going to play a game with you based on this idea, which is um, tell me that in three words what Birmingham is. And then we're going to go and see if Aston Villa represents that as well. What is Birmingham? You are, you are local. Um, you obviously spend all your life here. So what is Birmingham? So first, first word I'd go to is probably diverse. It's got a very uh, diverse, cult, lots of different cultures. Heads nodding, so yeah. they agree with you. Um, I'd say a vibrant city. So there's always a lot going on in Birmingham. I think of the third word. No, Another word. On the spot here. Any, home. Anyone? Home. He's, he's, home. home. Yeah, it's home. Yeah, home. home. yeah that's probably, I'll go with that one. I'll agree with you. <laughs> um, yeah, that kind of summarises Birmingham. Um, I think one thing I'd like to uh, say from... Sorry, uh, then that's Aston Villa as well for you. Yeah, that is it? exactly, yeah. Home. Home. Diverse and vibrant. Pretty much, yeah. 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 And yeah. I think we don't, you don't, you, we don't, we don't choose to support Aston Villa, you're chosen. And that's, that's that, I think that's a saying that resonates around the fan base and it feels like a, it's a fate to, to choose to support Aston Villa we don't choose to support them um, so yeah that's definitely something I've and the link between the city and the and the club is uh, is it close uh, the club looks after you yeah. Yeah, so I say I say the the community side of it, you know, it, it, that, the, the, it's it's really really vibrant uh, with with the Villa fans. And one thing I, I think is really um, always 
touch my, my, my sort of, uh, inner heart, like, sorry, when, when I've gone to the ground. You can always just talk to anyone around the ground. If, you, 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 if you're stood there having a beer at the ground and you, you talk to somebody next year, you, I, I, I wouldn't know any, some of the, I've, I've never met any of these people here, but I'm pretty sure if I, I met you at the ground, we could, we'd have a chat around the football like it's like you're my best mate sort of thing. So what's the weirdest thing that's ever happened when you do that, when you actually link with somebody start talking with somebody anything strange or anything not really or memorable? Yeah, I, I think you'd find well, a lot of people would probably find like hugging a random like stranger like, <laughs> quite quite yeah quite weird but like but as soon as you score you've got like a, I don't know, for example i went to the, the at the chelsea away game last last year um when when we scored the second goal i think it was morgan rogers correct me if i'm wrong when he when he got through and scored i had like an 85 year old man like jumping over me like i was like <laughs> it was, yeah it was incredible it's like yeah, but that just summarises, you know, the, the club and the ethos and, you know, there's just that, 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 that camaraderie between the fans. You know, we're, we're in it together through thick and thin, no matter if we're poor, good, we're, we're, we're there. And I think it resonates in, which we'll touch base on the ticket, ticket situation, no matter what, we are there to support the team through thick and thin. On that idea, by the way, one question to all of you, if anybody has got a good story about after the defeat or after the win, a trip back home that was memorable. Something that happened that you got to know people you you do. Go on that. <laughs> I was hoping that you'd ask this. Um, <laughs> uh, Villa nil, uh, Arsenal won. I think it was 2022. Uh, Saka scored, um, and then Mikel Arteta parked the bus. Um, and obviously, being a London resident, if I'm going to go see Villa against Arsenal, Spurs, Chelsea, Fulham, I'm travelling back with those fans. Um, and I remember with the shirt, with the, well, <laughs> you have to zip up, zip up your jumper, <laughs> um, scarf off, um, because as we all know, Arsenal fans can be a bit, bit rowdy. Um, and I was on this train back, um, back to London, and uh, we've got a new Avanti at New Street. They've kicked us off at Coventry because the Arsenal fans are just wrecking the train, battered everything, and they've actually had to kick us off. Um, we've got put on another train. Um, Arsenal fans still again causing trouble, whatever, nonsense. And I think we've got to Milton Keynes and I've just gone to take my charger out of my bag. And as I've gone to take my charger out of my bag, my scarf has fell out. Mm -hmm. And there was two ladies, I'd probably say late 60s, early 70s, just sat next to me. And one of them just looked at me. And she's giving me a wink. <laughs> and she was like, tough loss, right? And I was like, wait, you were there? And she was like, yeah, lower hole. And I was just like, Wow, and I think it's probably what, like a 40 minute journey back into Houston from there. Me and these two random elderly women who I probably would have never spoken to on any occasion had a chat about Villa now, Villa past. I think they've been season ticket holders both of them for like 20 years. Um, and I think that's one beautiful thing about Aston Villa um, and maybe football as a whole is that it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how old you are, how young you are. If they see a scarf, they're probably going to kick up a conversation with you. Wonderfully put. Wonderfully put. Um, let's jump into the uh, into the now. So you are finding yourselves in the Champions League and with a regime that has to do with the new owners and new manager that is taking you to new places. So um, I want to start with Luke. Um, what what? How does it feel to actually have a new owner with ambition? That seems to get in it right now. Yeah, I mean, the trajectory since they've been in has just been in one direction and it's just straight up. That that vertical line is just going. I remember when they first came in and I think whenever I think about Villa now and I think of Emery and whatever we can succeed in, in the future, I think we have to be thankful of like Dean Smith because the job that he did to galvanise the club as a Villa fan. We had a captain who was a Villa fan. It really brought the whole togetherness of the fan base. So when we was on that journey, that 10 game winning streak, getting to the playoffs, winning the playoffs, getting back into the Premier League, maintaining our position in the Premier League, it, it was just absolutely amazing. And, and the owners of, of just, yeah, I mean, it, when they came in, they must have had a dream of getting Villa to the Champions League and, and they've been able to do it without any sort of n negative area within their tenure at Aston Villa. So I think they have just been absolutely amazing and I think it's just brought back life into the football club after some really dark times. And I think we all appreciate the owners, we appreciate Dean Smith and then Unai Emery, I mean, 
I know we might touch on him in a bit, but for me, he's transformed the way I watch football. I thought I knew football, but the things that I'm seeing from this football club in the sense of mentality, philosophy, he's just transformed us. And, and I can't speak highly of Unai Emery because he's, he's what a man he is. He's, he's, just transformed us and you know when you go to games now you watch us you, there's an expectancy you know we expect to to see our team compete and play well and even the journey that we was on with him and getting into Europe the first time round in the conference league from a team that was scrambling around relegation you know we were a team that were we, we could have gone down with Gerard and, and he transformed us and not only has he done well he's he's coached players he's improved players he's made every single player better and i think when you're a fan and, and you can see that it just gives you a sense of of pride and i can't be more proud of the owners the manager and, and where we are as a fan base really in fact joe i want to ask a similar question which is to do with um they coming in there's always a question mark about what may happen um does that make you more in love with the club even um, I think yes and no. I think in a sense, um, us being Villa fans, we've, we've over the years we've dealt with potentially a lot of, of false promises. I think when Randy Lerner was was kind of at the helm, we saw a lot of early investment in the facilities in Bodymore Heath, and I think that got a lot of people excited. There was a, a feel around the club that we were we were on the up. That obviously didn't end as as Villa fans perhaps would have liked. We then had Tony Gia come into ownership and we had uh, cryptic tweets. We had um, lots of promises that were made around the direction that he wanted the club to go in. And again, fell short of that in quite a big way. Um, so with NSWE coming in, I think there was a lot of um, hope for fans. And there was also a lot of perhaps caution with, with what their version of Aston Villa's success looked like. But I think this is... This feels like the time where the, the promises are being fulfilled. This feels like we are getting action as well as the, the promises being made to fans. And I think that's really exciting. Um, I think some of the stories we've already heard, you know, weddings at Villa Park and, and Villa being called home, you know, it, it shows that as a, a fan base, we can, we can go through the tough times together. And now hopefully, fingers crossed, we have the opportunity to, to enjoy those, those successful times. Champions League football coming to Villa Park is a huge thing. And I think we have in a huge part, Unai Emery and, and Monchi as director of football and various other people around the club to thank for that. So I think, you know, Unai Emery is a, not only a tactical genius, I think he, he's built trust with Villa fans to the point where on the pitch decisions, we, we do trust him. I think signings, he's, he's been uh, a large part of. Um, we, we kind of we buy into what he wants to do. Um, the Morgan Rogers deal, especially, I think when that when that deal was originally sort of um, reported on, I think it had a lot of of caution from Villa fans, not really seeing where he'd fit in. And obviously, he's come in and he's been a revelation, and that's all been uh, in large part thanks to to Unai Emery. So he's a a tactical genius, and I think he's earned the trust of Villa fans over the last few years. So it's exciting that we have somebody at the helm who can kind of repay our, our loyalty and our faith. You, both of you, Joe, look at jumping because that was going to be the next thing I was going to ask you about, about uh, Unai Emery, but it's difficult to separate uh, the feeling that you've got about the club right now with, with Unai. We'll, we'll go more into Unai, but Ben, do you want to add anything else about the new regime and uh, what has meant to the club and to you? To be honest, I, thought, I think both um, the guys have just summarised it really well. So, uh, the tra trajectory has just been f phenomenal, hasn't it? Like, you know, we, 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 when, when they, they took over, we were literally in the, in the pits and it, it's literally been like, let's say, just an upward curve and it doesn't feel like it's going to stop anytime soon. So, yeah, I think you guys have summarised that really well. Bas, time to talk about Unai Emery. Just say anything you think about Unai Emery. Bas first. Don't know if that's allowed on a podcast. I'd say my real feelings about Unai Emery. But what, what, what I say about Unai Emery, we were talking about the new regime and people coming in. And the, the month before Unai Emery came in, Gerard was in charge. We played Chelsea at home. I got given a free ticket by a mate of mine. And I was thinking about demanding my money back at the end of the game. We were dreadful. We were absolutely dreadful. We, I think it was 2-0 Chelsea at the end. Very boring. After the game... Gerard came out and he basically said, what do you expect? It's Chelsea. They've got all these players. They've got all this money. Look at what I've got at Villa. They're, 
he, he didn't say they're a bunch of losers, but he was basically saying, what am I going to do with these people? What do you expect? Game before he got sacked, Fulham away. I very rarely watched a game after 30 seconds and thought, yeah, we're going to lose here. And we were dreadful. Emre comes in, the very first game. I mean, a lot of people have got some bad stories about Man United <laughs> because we haven't got a very good record uh, and we beat them. And you could see immediately what the tactical plan was. You could see the way we were going to play. Ironically, it was to set up the defence really well, which has kind of maybe slightly gone out of the way <laughs> in the more recent times. But you could see the way we were going to play and you could see we might not win every <laughs> week at that stage. We might not, you know, potentially... I mean, we... we, we probably didn't expect we were going to qualify for Europe that season but you could see the way we were trying to play and in January we brought one player a left back you know Moreno you don't usually think a, you know a left back is going to transform your team but he, so Emre took the same group of players that Gerard had that was saying you know they're rubbish you know what, what do you expect and he got them from 17th to 7th through playing a style of football that you could see I can see how that's going to work. And he evolved, sorted the defence out first, then pushing forward to attack. And it was just seeing that kind of half, half a season, getting into Europe on the last day, being Bryant at home. You're like, yeah, we're going, we are really going somewhere here. And this guy, he knows really exactly what he's doing. He's got the plan. And he mentioned earlier in terms of he's a coach, he improves players. These were the same players who were being booed off at Fulham kind of in October. And, you know, Premier League players are not terrible. You know, in terms of even when we went down, we had some decent players. But, you know, in terms of Emre just being able to get his plan across and known a guy who knows what he's talking about. And it's just been built through that the last couple of seasons since he's been here. It's just, I think somebody mentioned before, it's just proud being able to watch your club saying, there's a guy who knows what he's doing and we're going to turn up at a game and we've got a plan and we're going to, nine times out of ten, we're going to give the opposition a good game. And we're, going to, and we're going to win kind of quite more often than not now. And it, it, it's just fantastic feeling. Could kind of been a vilified. And that is down in a large sense to an I Emery. I think you will all sign below what, uh, what um, Bass has said. But I'd like to hear from more of you about, about Unai, about what he represents to you, what you see that is, that is added to the club. So take it, if you can, to a personal level, something you've seen of him doing in a game could be tactical, could be personal, something you heard about him that makes you feel we're really in good hands, Simon? For me, I think it's it's the first time that I've ever seen the fan base 100% behind exactly what the manager wants to do. We've had good managers in the past, like Martin O'Neill, although I'm not a fan of the way he left the club, but when he was actually there, you know, we had three top six finishes, but you would still get, I think, a, a section of the fans that would think, you know, there's there's things you could be doing better. Um, you know, the the lack of squad rotation that he had then. Whereas you look at Emery now, and I'd be amazed if there's a single fan who would question anything that the what the guy wants to do. And, and I do think that that three match losing period, where we conceded eleven goals in those three games, but I actually think that was a real pivotal moment where the whole everyone associated with the club, players, coach, and staff, fans all thought, okay. It might not work every time, but this is what we're going to do. And it's now we've got a manager that, for me, I genuinely believe that he has a game plan to beat any team that we come up against. The Bayern Munich game in a couple of weeks, we're not going to be favourites to win that. But he will have come up with a plan to beat them. And now, obviously, every player needs to execute that plan. And if they do, we'll win the game. Like, and, and I've never, I've, the fact that I'm sitting there as an Aston Villa fan watching my team knowing that we've got a manager who knows how to beat any opposition I just I honestly think we've got the, one of the best managers working in the game and it's just unbelievable I agree with it he is Gemma tell, tell me about um, what makes him a good leader how, how do you relate to him personally um, I think personally I relate I'm, I'm a grassroots football coach I've got my UEFA B badge um, so yeah I coach kind of outside of work with young kids um, and for me watching kind of Emery as a coach it massively inspires me because like you said like he's got a plan he's always got a plan and he hasn't got just plan A he's got plan B plan C plan D plan D, E F whatever it is all the way down to Z and he's probably got double A to double Z as well to be fair um, but yeah kind of so for me relatable wise as a coach 
I love to kind of watch different things that he's he's bringing in. So when he first came in, he had that box midfield, and I'd never really seen that box midfield. And I've tried it with my teams, and I was a very much four three three, and this is how we play, or a four two three one, or whatever it is, how we, however we play, um, depending on what team I was with, and just kind of him giving me that little bit of confidence to try something different whether Villa have even like tweeted out like different parts of a training video and I've gone oh that looks good I'll, I'll try that in in my next training session and yes I'm not going to have the detail of a, of a pro license coach I'll never ever try and pretend that I'm at that level of coaching but at B license level decent level of coaching I've gone actually yeah I can put that in and I can use that to my advantage and maybe tweak it a little bit to kind of work with my players. So yeah, massively inspiring for me. Wow, so basically makes you think differently about football. That's that's a big thing, but he doesn't communicate in your own language. Uh, and I'm going to you, Sam, because a musician has to um, have a language to communicate with the audience. That's how you do it. Uh, but in his case, it's about the word that he puts or that he makes other others put on the pitch what makes you rel relate to him. Um, you don't perhaps appreciate what he is like, but you appreciate his work. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I, f I find him to be a real mystery, to be honest. Um, there's always a language barrier, but the only thing I do know about him is he's obsessed and he is relentless. And he's also relentless in his interviews every game he gives the same interview after the game he says we want to connect with the fans we want to be consistent and he just he, it's like a mantra and that's the only thing that i think that's the way he must get through to the players he's very clear he has three or four messages and he gets those messages out and um really that's what we want to know from you <laughs> what is he doing what is he doing and how is he doing this because you know, it's it's incredible what he does. And we're a very pessimistic fan base. And we're having to learn that we might beat Bayern Munich in two weeks. That's something that we're having to come to terms with. Do you know what I mean? But with Emery, he, he surprises us again and again and again. We think, oh, well, it's been a good run, but it's probably going to come to an end soon and then we'll come back down to where we're used to being. But with Emery, he just, it's like he won't uh, allow it. He doesn't allow it like that uh, four game losing streak. It's as if he said, all right, well, I tried to let you off the hook, but now we're doing it my way. You know, mm -hmm. he doubles down and, 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 you know, sometimes I worry that he's going to exhaust the players with the information that he's giving them, but, it doesn't seem to happen and I think, I think, I don't know if I speak for everyone else, I am just terrified that he's going to leave. That's the way I feel and I just want us to achieve something while we've got him. I think that's what it is because we've been waiting a long time to have somebody like Unai Emery. So just give me a League Cup, give me an <laughs> FA Cup. I know he's not even bothered about those, he, he's going <laughs> above that but you know we're we're so downtrodden over a long, long period of time that having some long, someone like Unai Emery that is just, you know, we've been, he's like he's dragging us along with him. It's like, we're going to the Champions League and, you know, well, you know, we might, we might get, might maybe Europa League, you know. No, we're going to the Champions League and, and knowing what he's like, he's like, oh no, we're getting out of the group. We're going places and you're coming with me. And that's the feeling that I think we have every week is he's dragging us along with him and maybe he's dragging the club with him, you know, and um, I don't know what the hell he's doing, but, <laughs> well, but it's Sam, great. You gave, him, you gave me an idea uh, how we're going to finish this, which uh, I'm going to ask you, so start thinking of it. What would you like to know about the club that I could just now give him the possibility to talk to the players, to the people, decision makers, owners, whatever, um, you like to know why you like what you know what 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 is the what other mysteries are out there related to Aston Villa right now but before we get there we've seen uh, the relation to the city the, um, the what's happening on the pitch how happy you are right now there's the other side of course 
which needs to be, as we said earlier, the same level of ambition and good decisions, which is the commercial sponsorship side. And there's been controversy about ticket prices related to the Champions League. But um, Adam, you are, you are an expert on this. I would like to hear more from you. If you want to put yourself in the position of the club, why would they do that thing knowing that's unpopular, putting yeah. the prices up? In regards to the ticket prices, yeah. they're so far behind everyone else. I think Luke mentioned it earlier that we, I've got a lot of catching up to do. We're trying to compete with those, the media six, I like to call them, not the big six. We're trying to compete with that media six. And our commercial deals and our sponsorship deals are only 20% of our revenue compared to Manchester United, Liverpool, who's around 40 to 45% of their revenue. And we're only turning over around 200 to 250 million a year. And they're turning over six to 900 million a year. So you can imagine it's not even, not even comparable because it's not as if, oh, we're both 25%, it's fine because the same, they, they earn more. It's not that. I've got a big question, which is what was Christian Perslow doing for so long? You know, there's so many people on X or Twitter that go, oh, bring back Perslow. Why they want Perslow back is because he didn't upset the apple cart. You know, he didn't do anything that really pissed anyone off. He just kind of went along and, and did it. What was he doing for two years, three years, whilst we were in the Premier League that meant that our commercial deals were so poor? Just look at the bottom of our, of our website. We've got six sponsors on there. There's a Champions League club. Those... Those clubs that we're competing with have 25, 30 commercial partners. Now, the big problem that we've got and why I'm frustrated by it, but also why I'm kind of excited by it at the same time is the fact that we've not been activating those sponsorships in the right way for such a long time. So what happens is we bring in a sponsor and we take the maximum revenue from them as much as possible up front. So what happens is, Brand comes to Aston Villa, knocks on the door, Mr. Perslow, I've got five million pounds. Mr. Perslow goes, thank you very much, there's five million pounds in, in Aston Villa's pockets and, and we go from there. Now, that's the incorrect way to do it. The big clubs will say, we'll take three million, you've got to spend two million pounds on activating that sponsorship. Because what that then allows them to do is get an ROI on that investment. Because they're spending five million pounds on that, on that investment and the, the way that it's done in the States is that it's part of the whole marketing mix. It's not a sponsorship on the side. It's part of the full market mix and they're making strategic decisions to work with football clubs to integrate it into their full market mix. Whereas what's happening at Aston Villa is they go vanity projects. We get Patano in the middle of the shirt. We get um, Kazoo on the middle of the shirt. And Aston Villa do absolutely nothing with it, apart from going, it's all right, you get, a me you get four media days a year where you can come and play a silly game with one of the players and nothing results of that. No fan buys something from, from that brand because those brands aren't engaging with any of us. And it's a big problem. So I know that Chris Heck comes under a lot of scrutiny because he does a lot of things that annoy the fans. He puts up prices, he puts in hospitality, he wrongly his team puts up disabled parking doubles that and has done a u-turn on that this week however one thing that we've got to be excited about is he comes from the world of sponsorship he comes from the world of brand building and he comes from the world of luke said before he's trying to bring you 400 million pounds of extra revenue into the club over the next three years the only way to do that is by building strategic partnerships with brands who are going to pay for that not by ripping off those fans like if he continues to take money from the fans it's just going to make us disillusioned we will walk away we, we know there's probably people who who already have and that first game should be such a celebration for us we should be walking into that stadium thinking wow it's our 150 year anniversary this year to be doing that in the champions league to be doing that after feeling like three four years ago we're probably going to be relegated to be doing that when we have gone through the worst period of football in the last 10, 10 years it just felt like we were going down 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 and we could have easily been a Sunderland or a Derby or a Blues playing in League One eight years ago we're in the Champions League everyone should be going there buzzing yet there's this little niggling thing now where we're going spent a pound a minute on this now that shouldn't be the case and the only way to solve that is by bringing in commercial deals and He's brought over a couple of really great people. He's brought over Ron, who's come from um, New York Red Bulls, and he's also brought in Ryan, who's the head of content as well, who's who are both really great commercially minded people. However, it's going to take a lot, a lot more than that. They, you know, they've made the 
the staff base, I think they've hired an extra 20% of people in the last 12 months, but if they need more people in the commercial roles, they're get, having people like Elmo go in um, internationally to try and build our brand in other countries, which is the right thing to do. However, who are the commercial people in those countries to build those deals, meaning that it's not us, that's, that's basically paying the price. People, I'm learning so much uh, about about the commercial side, as we heard, about your relationship to the club, about the essence of the club, about what it means to you, stories that have come out, are emotional stories and funny stories. I'm thinking you could be the introduction of the book. I think you've written my first chapter, the first part of the book. It could be your stories. It could be what you just put in front of me. Uh, but to say goodbye to this content, I like to hear from you to, to, to ask me what, or to, to guide me really, what should I look for? What is the mystery of Aston Villa? What things you need to hear to actually um, get to know the club better? Help me, anybody. Um, I think there's two sides to Aston Villa. Um, and I think you've got, as a lot of people said, you've got the on-pitch sides that you can talk about and you've got the off-pitch off side that you can talk about. And I think the thing that kind of differentiates Aston Villa with a lot of clubs is a lot of clubs, when you look at the past 20 years, their ownership and their hierarchy, they've got an ethos and something that you can connect to. We've had how many owners in the last 20 years? It feels like from when I was 13 to 24, Aston Villa has been through three or four different periods, but it always feels like something sticks, whether it's Randy Lerner, Tony Shaw, um, Nassif Suiris, Wes Edens, Chris Heck, Christian Perslo. There's always, it always feels like a, I wouldn't call it a struggle, but I think certain people come into Aston Villa and the hierarchy and they go, oh, I want it to be like this. And they can never do that. Because I think as a fan base, we're very kind of at our core, trying to keep something that is there. And I don't know what it, I, I actually don't know what it is. Um, I've, you know, I've been to most games in the past three or four years. But even, you know, taking my girlfriend, for example, she doesn't like football. She hates football. Uh, first game was Villa Spurs. We lost 4-0. But she went away from that thing, you know, saying to me, what is it about everyone in Villa Park that is so common? Um, and I think maybe a lot of Aston Villa fans, it might take a while to think about what do we have in common that keeps us wearing this badge. People from all different kind of, you know, backgrounds and stuff so if if I was you know giving you advice to write a book I'd say ask a question that I don't think a lot of us could probably answer very quickly okay. but could probably be described over a book okay any more please yeah I think it would be advisable if you can you can somehow manage to swing it get yourself in the away end of a villa of a villa game once you sit with the away fans from the villa um, you know, being in the whole end is one experience, but when you sit with that real core that, you know, that go there week in, week out, every single game, that's when you feel the real passion from the real fans. For me, that's, I've never experienced anything like our away fans. I'll do that for sure. Yeah, just say, uh, <laughs> another thing as well is, uh, and I don't know if anyone else has picked, you probably all have. It's amazing, especially with foreign players, ex-foreign players, the amount of um, like players from abroad who've come and played for Villa that when they leave, still love the football club. You look at uh, Carl Squires one, Melbourne, Martin Lawson, Juan Pablo Angel regularly comes back. It's, it's always been the case, as, as far as I remember, uh, players that come to Villa, it's a special football club. Carl Squires. Yeah, Carl Square, yeah. Um, uh, Wilfred Boomer, even Mila Yednak when he came. It's, it, there's, there's something about the football club that I, I don't think, and this is what uh, another thing that I'd stress is I don't think people outside the villa realise just how big and just how special the football club it is. And the amount of times you hear footballers say, I didn't realise how big the football club was until I got there. And I think that's that's one of the biggest things. I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about Unai Emery. I think because in the media we hear so much about how he failed at Arsenal and how he, his tenure there wasn't that great. And I mean, we've seen success at Seville, Villarreal and obviously Villa. So he obviously loves the Villa. But I just want to know how he felt being at Arsenal, leaving Arsenal, then coming to Villa. Like, 
what was his motivation? Did he feel like he could get Villa back into the top end of the Premier League? Did he feel like he could get us competing in Europe? And more of like how his like methodology is, like how does he work? What does he? What are his core values from his actual mouth? And how does he feel at Villa? Because as a fan base, we now absolutely like love him to bits. Like if, if I met him, I'd probably bow down to him. <laughs> but I just feel like I want to know everything about him because he's a character that's just come in. And and I think when you have a manager, sometimes you get vocal ones that do a lot of talking, but he doesn't really. like. Even in pre-season, over the years, we've had a manager that's always does a little interview about how the, the pre-season's going, and we, we heard nothing from him. So I would personally like to just find out more about the man, because I am reading a book that um, an author called Molina did, and it was all about his time at Arsenal, and I kind of want this phase now, so that's what I'd love to know. I would say Unai Emery is probably the person I've spoken the most in football in the last 15 years. Um, and I do know a lot about what has happened, but a lot of answers have to be given as well because it's not the same to talk about it when we did. We did an interview in Spanish, which is in my YouTube channel, a few months after leaving Arsenal. If you talk to him about that period now, the answers will be different. So now is, is in a mature place to look back and answer a lot of those questions. So hope the book can do a lot of that. Yeah, I'd like to lead very much on that. I think looking at, at Unai Emery um, as a kind of a tactician and a manager and someone that we all know now to be a genius of, of football. Um, I've been lucky enough to sit uh, after the Bournemouth game um, when we won 3-1 uh, uh, from last year um, in a press conference with Unai Emery and him, hearing him talk about the club and, and football in general is inspiring. Um, so yeah, I think I'd kind of like to unlock what he defines as success at this football club, what, he, what motivates him, what sort of goal he has in mind that is driving him to um, create this, this kind of style that we all now know and, and love. I think finding out what, what he defines as success obviously whether it's um the same as what we all would define as success under emery would be i think really interesting but just hearing him talk about the club you can tell that he's really bought into the city the culture the fan base and i think when a, a manager from specifically another country comes in and, and although he's worked in england before having somebody who buys into your city and buys into your culture you know there's there's photos of him walking the canals of birmingham which i think you know just goes to show that he, he does care about this football club and i think that's really inspiring so unlocking a little bit more about why what he sees as success with this project i think would be really interesting I'd like to selfishly understand what their plan is because there's only so long he can do this for and this summer we got into the champions league and we spent a net six million pounds on that squad that's not good enough and must be, I don't know, I've not looked at it, must be the lowest of any club to have their first Champions League team and spend £6 million. That's crazy. And that will only continue if something's not done. So what is the club's plan to make sure that commercially we can back him up? Mm -hmm. Because my biggest worry is, as everyone said, he one day just goes, you know what? this is too much you're putting everything on me and the club's not I'm over there the club's still over here I'm dragging it along and it's not coming with me and he ends up just going I'll just finish my career at Real Union mm -hmm. and, and, and does what he wants there so yeah what, what is the commercial plan of the club over the next few years is what I'd like to know Villa are known as an historic club which basically translate as we won all our trophies before the war. And in terms of the, the pundits, like on Sky, for example, they always talk about Villa in very favourable terms. That's because they went to Villa and they won kind of most of the time. So we're always seen as, you know, like the cuddly, the cuddly teddy bear of the Premier League, you know. Yeah, we'll have a nice time and we'll go away and win. But in terms of our dressing room now, I'll, I'll just pick one player. We've got Emmy Martinez, World Goalkeeper of the Year, World Cup winner, Copper America winner. Like a Real, you could. I mean, we'd all say around this table, best goalkeeper in the league, other opinion in the world. Other opinions are available, they're wrong, but we, we, we've never been used at Villa to having that real echelon of players. So, what I'd like to know about Emre from the players in the dressing room is in terms of the Emmy Martinez in this world, which is the type of players you need if you're going to be winning championships, winning champions leagues, you know, kind of the real trophies. Yeah, you know, I take the FA Cup as somebody said before. Are those level of players, are they 
re- are they buying into the Emirates? Are they like, okay, if we're playing Bayern Munich first Champions League game, are, are they going to say, if they've got the call from Bayern, they're going to go, no, no thanks. We're here for Emre because of X, Y, Z. We all love him. I mean, we talked about how much we love him. Are the players in the, the real top quality players? Because we've always been used to our best player. We've always had to sell eventually. They've made their money, their <laughs> reputation at Villa. They like, okay, we're going to go somewhere else. And we, sometimes they've left with best wishes. Sometimes not. Um, some John Gregory quotes about some players leaving. Look, look them up. But yeah, so in terms of players, we've got in the dressing room 2024, the real some of the best players in the world we've got now, are they buying into the MRA revolution for the long term? That'd be something I'd really like to know. I'll be a whole year trying to answer those those questions. So um, you opened my eyes big time. So we're going to do one last thing. I want you to tell me what Villa means to you in one word. So we're going to go around the table before we say goodbye. Joe, despite that face, we start with you. Another <laughs> word. Okay. Um... I'm going to say my one word's going to be positive. Do you want me to explain it or do I pass I'm a pass? No, just a word. Just positive. Pass. Family. Simon. Everything. Sam. Passion. Gemma. Sorry. Religion. DJ. Anticipation. Adam. Hope. Luke. Life. Sam. Heritage. So thank you very much for your time. It's been absolutely a pleasure to be with you. We can do the singing if you want, but first should we have a, a run on yeah, yeah. Green's Kings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Pop. yeah we can do that. Thank you, Green King, and everybody else for being here. Thank you. Bravo! Bravo. 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 Thank you very much.